What fan theory about a movie, TV show, or video game do you see as 100% canon? In the Who Shot Mr. Burns episode of The Simpsons Mr. Burns is discovered shortly after being shot and is surrounded by a number of characters, including Krusty the Clone. However, on close inspection it is absolutely irrefutable that it isn't Krusty at all, but Homer Simpson in Krusty Macube, compared to when Homer dressed up as Krusty while in clown college. Homer was actively on his way to kill Mr. Burns, while disguised as Krusty, echoing when he saw Sideshow Bob Rob the Quickie Mart, while disguised as Krusty, but was beaten by mere seconds when Maggie shot him. On a somewhat similar note, Krusty was originally intended to be Homer in disguise. The idea was that Bart had no respect for Homer but worshipped Krusty. And that's why Krusty looks like Homer with Clown Macube. In Over the Garden Wall, Greg's whole dream sequence, where he is in Cloud City is a trick by the beast, so he will give himself over willingly. This makes sense, because according to the woodsman's warning the beast can only get you, if you are weak of body or spirit. This deal allows a beast, to weaken Greg physically to turn him into a nettlewood tree. In addition if you go back, and watch the episode there is a lot of suspicious imagery, including a black turtle. This of course makes the queen of the clouds the beast himself. After watching this series many times I just can't accept that this is not the case, especially considering how jarring this Cloud City episode is from the overall theme of the show. Every time I see it, I pick up on something else that makes me think this is the case. Edit. Terrible mobile typing. All of the time manipulation in Breath of the Wild. Pausing. Flurry rush. Bullet time. Etc. Are actually canon, and are part of Link's champion ability. All of the champions have an especial ability, and as the Hillian champion it makes sense for Link to have one too. There is a great video by Nintendo Black Crisis about this, youtube.com link, that explains most of this, but I wanted to add that this goes along with his character throughout the series. Link is strongly associated with Time, Egg, Hero of Time, and the Timeline Split. Many of the games are associated with Time. Ocarina of Time, Majora's Mask, and the official timeline is contingent on it. It fits the lore of Bot W, and explains why he is so overpowered, and I just think it's a really cool theory. Pinky in the brain. One is a genius, the other's insane. We're lead to believe that it's brain that is the genius. But the order that the lyrics of the song go tells the real truth. In every episode, Brain gets the two of them into deep trouble via some crazy, some might say insane, scheme to take over the world. And Pinky, invariably, finds a simple and elegant way to safely remove them from the situation. Pink is the genius. It's the Brain that's insane. Very niche theory, but I 100% believe that the Disney film Atlantis, The Lost Empire and the Mass Effect game series take place in the same universe. Belated edit, full theory explained here, reddit.com link, for people asking. You talked about one of the best Disney movies ever made, I'm gonna need you to explain. Alright, well, this will take a good long while, but you asked for it, so buckle up. Also should probably mention, that this will contain spoilers for Mass Effect and touches on the much maligned RGB ending for the series. Also also this will mostly be a list of similarities between the two series, but in the end I'll give a TLDR which will include a brief synopsis on how I think Atlantis fits in the Mass Effect timeline. First let's start with the creature that initially inspired this theory, the Great Leviathan, vignette.wikia.nokaki.net link, which guards the entrance to Atlantis. It is a lobster-esque synthetic organism which shoots beams of fire from its maw, which, if you've played Mass Effect, sounds eerily similar to the Reapers, the titular villains of the series, masseffect.fandom.com link. Now I will say for the theory's narrative, that I don't think the Leviathan is a Reaper, there are some dissimilarities, chief of which being, that the Leviathan isn't hell-bent on the destruction of the Atlanteans themselves, but I'm saying, that it could be based on Reaper tech. Speaking of tech, the Atlanteans each wear a bluish crystal around their neck. This crystal, when used in proximity to the the heart of Atlantis, AtlantisTheLustEmpire.Fandom.com link, more on that later, 
can power technology be used to create force fields and can even extend the lives of those wearing the crystals and i propose that in the future humanity would come to know this material as element zero masseffect.fandom.com link or ezo when an electrical current runs through ezo it produces something called a mass effect field which can be used to propel ships through space atlantis celestempire.fandom.com link and create force fields atlantis celestempire.fandom.com link additionally creatures exposed to ezo early in development develop an ability called biotics masseffect.fandom.com link which allow them to manipulate mass effect fields to their advantage one of the only races to have inherent biotic abilities are the Aseri, masseffect.fandom.com link, who, it should be noted, can live to be 1000 years old. However, the Aseri didn't come by those biotic abilities naturally. In Mass Effect 3, we learn that the Aseri were uplifted by a more advanced alien race known as the Protheans, masseffect.fandom.com link. This uplifting included providing the Aseri with technology, and altering their DNA to better suit their needs. In turn, the Aseri saw them as gods. However when the Reapers arrived, the Protheans had to abandon the Aseri, leaving behind a beacon in the form of an artificial intelligence, masseffect.fandom.com link. Which brings us to, the heart of Atlantis, atlantisthelestempire.fandom.com link. It is the source of the Atlanteans power, but it's also described as being alive somehow. It can also choose a host, to act as its conduit, but if the host is exposed to the heart of Atlantis for too long, they can be lost to it forever, which, I argue, is exactly what happens to Shepard in the control ending of Mass Effect 3, masseffect.fandom.com link. Now I'll just be honest here, this is mostly inspired by the fact, that the AI catalyst masseffect.fandom.com link, and crystalline kidder, vignette.wikia.nokaki.net link, looked eerily similar to me. In conclusion, here is how I think Atlantis, the lost empire fits into the universe of Mass Effect. Atlantis and the Atlanteans were an experiment by the Protheans to uplift humanity, but the Protheans were forced to abandon Atlantis, before they could spread that technology to the rest of the world. However, they did not leave Atlantis alone. In their absence they left behind an artificial intelligence to watch over the fledgling human colony which would later come to be known as the heart of Atlantis. With this advanced technology the Atlanteans prospered, but King Kashakum Nedak, atlantisthelestempire.fandom.com link, while trying to use the heart of Atlantis as a weapon, accidentally activated a defense protocol, leading him to believe their demise was caused by the gods being displeased with his actions. In activating this protocol the heart sunk Atlantis beneath the sea, lost to the rest of the world until the events of the movie. There's also some other little things I didn't mention, like there being an alien script is Matt's effect which I think, looks extremely similar to Atlantean. And also the fact, that the book leading to Atlantis is called The Shepherd's Journal, I mean come on. Needless to say you could probably poke a thousand holes in this theory, but I think it's fun, so I like to believe it. Jeremy Renner in tag, is hockey while he's on vacation from the Avengers. My headcanon is that all of Jeremy Renner's movie characters are the same person. He's a bomb disposing, ill taking super soldier, who also helps out with the IMF and the Avengers. Jack from Titanic never existed, he was entirely made up by Rose as a fantasy. For a movie that put so much effort into being as historically accurate as possible, one starts seeing a pattern where most of the mistakes revolve around Jack. He carries gear that hadn't been invented yet, he references places that didn't exist until after the Titanic sunk, and was all around exactly what a rich person would think a happy poor person was like that it just makes way more sense that he was fictional even in universe. Copy slash paste where I typed it out in a comment. She was getting married to someone she didn't love for the sake of money. Cal may not even have been that bad of a guy, but she didn't like him, so she tells everybody he was horrible. And then, well, it's the freaking Titanic, an event so mentally scarring and awful we are still taking about it over a hundred years later. It was so awful she can't stand to think about it unless something good happened, and suddenly there is Jack. This lovable scamp 
that just sweeps her off her feet in a torrid romance with someone who loves her for her and not her money, where she learns that poor people have incredible dance parties and are happy and everything is just so romantic and perfect. And the details about Jack are just wrong. Jack talks about riding the roller coaster at Santa Monica Pier until he threw up, but that coaster wasn't built until 1916. The Titanic sank in 1912. Jack talks about ice fishing on Lake Wissota. That's a man-made reservoir that wasn't created until 1917. The buttons on Jack's borrowed coat are actually from a famous designer that created them in 1922. The song they danced to in steerage was written by a man who wasn't even born until 1923. Jack's rucksack is a standard issue Swedish military bag, first made in 1939. Just over and over again the anachronisms and continuity errors circle around Jack. Things that a rich person thinks poor people would say or do, using places and songs and props that didn't actually exist at the time. Even other filming mistakes make more sense this way. We see Jack and Rose running around in the ship as it floods. The water is horizontal with the floor. The ship would have been tilting by that point, which means the water level should have been diagonal. Very hard to film that, but if Rose as a rich white woman was one of the first ones in a lifeboat, she would have been imagining what it would be like to be in a sinking ship and hence her description would be wrong. Aka, Rose was making something up to help her deal with the horror she lived through and spliced the narrative together over the years after the fact. And the only solid evidence that even comes close to backing her story up, the drawing? It's not like it's signed by Jack. And it was found in Cal's belongings, safely tucked away. Which is more likely that Jack is real and perfect in every way and that for some reason jealous angry Cal got his hands on the drawing and kept it without every mentioning it, or that maybe Cal had someone draw it while on the ship as glorified wank bank material and squirreled it away and Rose just worked that into her fantasy. Courage the cowardly dog doesn't really live in the middle of nowhere, but because of Muriel's age he never leaves their house or property. Every visitor is a monster because he of course doesn't know them and sees them as a threat. This. As I got older I realized he's exactly what the title says he is, a cowardly dog, and no one was evil or out to get anyone. That Emperor Palpatine siphoned off Padme's life energy to preserve Darth Vader in Revenge of the Sith. In Inspector Gadget, Dr. Claw is the original Gadget, who was horribly disfigured in an accident. Gadget is a cyborg replacement who has taken over his life, and he's trying to extract his revenge. He stays hidden as his family would never recognize him, and watching his replacement befriend Penny has driven him mad. That toys in the Toy Story universe freeze up by instinct. An instinct that is so good it will probably never fail. It's why Buzz freezes up in the first film despite not knowing he's a toy, and how they always seem to be able to freeze up at the mere sound of a door opening and things like that. Every close call they have is really them worrying for no reason. If the human got closer to seeing them the instinct would have kicked in. Also, they can break the instinct the same way we can manually control our breath, which is how Woody talks to Sid in the first film. Toy Story 4 made the rules of their world very odd regarding the whole Forky thing. The Kalo has cancer theory is pretty convincing. Would explain why everyone gives him what he wants, even when he's being a little shit. The reason the glass slipper in Cinderella didn't turn back to a regular slipper or disappear at midnight is because the fairy godmother was messing with us. Her main goal was to set Cinderella up for life and to do that she needed a way for the prince to find her. She could easily have magic Cinderella into the life she wanted, arbitrary midnight deadline be damned, but instead the fairy godmother decided to make the prince want her for her own qualities and to prove his love by tracking Cinderella down. It's like the theory in Aladdin, that it's all in pursuit of his first wish, that is, to make Aladdin a prince. He doesn't become a prince, until he marries Jasmine and the Sultan changes the rules, until then, he only appears to be a prince. Until that point, the genie is acting in pursuit of a larger goal. Magic uses our Trixie. Momo is in fact a reincarnation of Ang's old mentor monk Jayatso. I may be wrong, but I'm pretty sure this isn't a fan theory it was an actual storyline from the show that was just cut. So it's semi-canon? Fo Bang Joe I were secretly hooking up throughout the entire show. 
This was actually written in by showrunners. It was going to be revealed at last episode. Kind of like, whenever big major events were happening, they somehow were covering up that they were hooking up. But they felt it would be too much for the ending, as it would have made Phobes marriage questionable, and also ruin some of the iconic moments. So it was skipped. I like to think that Ben Affleck in the town is a grown up version of him in Good Will Hunting. Fits his whole speech about how he'll still be doing this when he's 50. That Bill Cipher survived the end of Gravity Falls. There are some very cryptic and promising hints coming from an official scavenger hunt by Alex Hirsch himself. I'd think that this is canon in the Choose Your Own Adventure book, there's a hidden page that leads to this i.pinning.com link. Some people think that a different form, a different time refers to King and the Owl House, which would be pretty neat. In the office, US, Jan never went to a sperm bank. She cheated on Michael with Hunter and conceived Astrid with him. So raw, so wrong, so right, all night, all re i i i t The real world in the Matrix is actually a second Matrix simulation, and the free humans are actually machines being trained to understand humans. That's why Nia was able to use powers in the real world to blow up machines in the other two movies, it was a second Matrix. This would have been 100% less disappointing. The question would become, how many layers are there? It's turtles all the way down, mate. Futurama, Bender was not always a criminal, but got a reset and reprogram in the Hall of Prisoners. In the pilot, he was upset that he was making machines that humans used to kill themselves. Then, he gets an electric shock in the Hall of Prisoners and takes on a whole new attitude. This new attitude of steal everything and kill all humans does not fit with his original persona in the pilot. This possibility is supported in a later episode, he gets rebooted in the Pluto Penguin Conservatory and takes on the identity of a penguin. I mean, in the pilot he was scamming the suicide booth with a quarter on a string. In Ant-Man, Ant-Man and the Wasp and the rest of the MCU, the reason pine particles are so inconsistent in their behavior is because, when creating them, Hank Pym accidentally tapped into the same dimensional energy that Doctor Strange and his fellow sorcerers use, this time originating from the quantum realm. I also like the theory that only Hank Pym actually understands the particles, and he constantly explains them incorrectly on purpose, because he doesn't want anyone else to misuse them. With regard to Star Wars, I always like to believe that there was hidden aspect to duels we never saw. While fighting with lightsabers, they were constantly trying to push each other off balance or turn off their opponent's lightsaber. And that's why they spent so much time doing dumb shit like spinning around for no reason. To my knowledge it's explained as the force users can see or sense well the opponents move like a second into the future so they're trying to throw them off to land a decisive blow. I have a theory that Olaf is an extension of Elsa's consciousness. Everything he does is really Elsa trying to help her sister. Yeah, I think that's pretty much canon. He repeats things he heard the sisters say to each other, like the sky's awake, and I like warm hugs, and displays some very Elsa-like behavior as the movie goes on, because I love you, I insist you run, and nearly melting trying to warm Anna up. His sole desire at the start of his life is to experience summer, something Elsa would never have gotten to do growing up, and in Olaf's frozen adventure, he wants to take part in all of the Christmas festivities that she couldn't. He has a childish personality, because a part of Elsa never really moved on from when she was 8. Marshmallow represents her desire to be left alone and safe, he looks and acts intimidating and lashes out when he feels threatened, even if the threat is actually minor, but is ultimately kind. In Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, in a chapter called The Forbidden Forest, Harry is saved from Quirrell slash Voldemort by Fionn's the Centaur. They encounter Bane and Ronan, who had previously remarked Mars is bright tonight, and the two centaurs chastise Fionn's for interfering with what the stars had laid out. Harry later wonders whether the stars said that Voldemort would kill him in the forest that night, and whether that's what the centaurs believed would happen without Fionn's involvement. In the final book, 
Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows. Harry realizes that his destiny is to be killed by Voldemort in order for the latter's horcruxes to all be destroyed completely. He decides to go through with sacrificing himself for the cause, returning to the Forbidden Forest to confront Voldemort unarmed. The chapter ends with Voldemort successfully casting the killing curse at Harry, who appears to die. Although this is never explicitly stated, or even implied at any point, my firm belief is that this encounter is what the centaurs read in the stars six years previously, not the one that happened in Philosopher's Stone, as they expected. What with divination, being among the most difficult of magical arts to practice, they got the what right, mostly, but got the when completely wrong. The chapter in which Harry is killed is even called the forest again. Probably as a reference to that first chapter in which his death was foreseen. Edit. Shameless plug for our podcast, www.theharrypodcast.com link, where we talk about Harry Potter, like it's English class. Tweet this to JK Rowling, she'll most likely take it on board as canon, if it isn't already, and if it is then great analysis and she'll confirm it. Either that or say, that Fiennes is gay or something. The Flintstones and the Jetsons take place in the same post-apocalyptic time frame, where the wealthy would escape to sky cities and flying cars, and the poor would rebuild society as cavemen. It would certainly explain how everyone in Bedrock celebrates Christmas, has traffic lights, etc. Kevin McAllister from Home Alone grows up to become Jigsaw from Saw. That would mean Saw has to take place in like 2050 though. Makes sense that Jigsaw uses ancient and archaic traps and torture, from the early 2000s. Joker in the Dark Knight trilogy was a former black ops soldier gone insane. It makes sense, due to his knowledge with explosives, he always changed up his backstory depending on who he is talking to, and during his interrogation, he made a comment towards Batman about not striking the person you're interrogating in their head. As if he has training and experience. Another reason is due to how, when they checked for him on every known database he would not come up on any records. There's a thing about black ops soldiers, if they are declared missing, killed, or captured their country will denounce any knowledge of their existence and they will likely be erased from all records. My personal guess he was declared missing. During the Joker's conversation he made a very specific example about the truck full of soldiers getting blown, and the government says nobody panic. That was oddly specific, as if he was on that truck himself. Another example is when attempts to shoot the Gotham Mayor with a rifle at a rally it explains his familiarity with it. But as for where he got the training he was clearly ex-special forces, very likely, and then moved on to work for the CIA. But Christopher Nolan, the director, has yet to confirm or deny the theory, so he will forever remain a mystery. I fucking love this. Just to add, the scene where he kills the mayor there are sniper rifles set up perfectly in the windows. He knew the protocol of highly trainer snipers. He was also able to take out the snipers and tie them up. He has serious special forces training. And with the interrogation scene, he tells the cops you always see who someone truly is right before they die. It goes to show he's had lots of experience with seeing people die close up and listen to their final words. The Joker himself probably saw himself for who he was right before he thought he was going to die. His true self was revealed with the scars. Note, the Joker never shows any fear, like he's already seen the scariest shit imaginable, so everything else is just nothing to him. Maybe the Joker was the only survivor of the truck explosion, and seeing the government not care, after he's seen his brothers in arms die, broke him while at the same time made his mind perfectly clear with what he had to do next. It fits. The Joker and Batman are the opposite sides of the same coin, loss, and grief. The Joker gives into it and goes insane, adopting an nihilistic worldview, and goes about enacting and gifting similar experiences to others, so they can be like him. Batman is galvanized by his experience into protecting others from the horrors of loss, stopping others from becoming like him. See how he treats his rogue gallery with compassion, and trying for rehabilitation. It's more obvious with his adoption of the Robins, most of all Dick Grayson. Cursed Child does not exist. It's canon but still. It's literally fan fiction JK Rowling agreed to slap her name on. 
There's so much better fan fiction of Harry Potter out there though. At least pick a decent one if you're going to slap your name on it. My Immortal World have been a better choice. The Room is a film adaptation of The Sims. Edit to everyone doing references to the Bikini Bottom Horror by you slash still in the simulation I wrote this comment knowing damn well about this story. I'm even one of this redditor's followers so yes it's a good fan fiction, but the theory part stops itself at crap, is using starfish meat, because he actually know about biology or some shit. Except this doesn't work, since we know for a fact that Mr. Dot Crablink invented it waay before knowing who the fuck Patrick is but semantics. That Mr. Dot Crablink s is killing other crabs, and that their meats are the secret ingredient of the Krabby Patty's secret recipe. 1. The Krusty Krab is designed after a real life crab trap that fishermen use, and considering that the creator of SpongeBob was a marine biologist, I doubt that it's a coincidence. 2. We never actually see any other crab in Bikini Bottom apart from Mr. Dot Crablink, himself, and his mother. We see some crabs in special episode, but we never actually see one in Bikini Bottom on a daily basis. So, Mr. Dot Crablink might be the one that killed him. 3. Mr. Dot Crablink may have invented the recipe, but we never saw him actually eat one, either because the thought of eating a member of his species disgust him, or because he wants to avoid any health problem related to such a diet. 4. Real life crabs, when stuck in the traps I talked about earlier, will often eat each other out of stress of being trapped there. 5. Mr. Dot Crablink is often considered an allegory of the American dream and an extreme form of the capitalist society. So doing something like a murder doesn't seem too far-fetched when we know how immoral the guy can be. 6. Mr. Dot Crablink did ate one of his own burger once and said so this is why I taste like or something among those lines. He might have been joking. Or did he? 7. The name of the burger itself. The Krabby Patty. The Krabby. Patty. Krabby. The name itself is already a big fucking clue. The official recipe of the Krabby Patty can be found and made at home. And that's where this theory started. Because the secret ingredient was designated as crab meat imitation. But the theory suppose that it's actually not an imitation for all the reasons stated above. I always figured there was no secret ingredient. Mr. Krabs will literally sell out his employees for a penny, so he wouldn't spend a lot of money on anything. It also works as people will be intrigued by the secret. There is an idea that there is no secret ingredient. SpongeBob is the secret. He isn't taught the recipe when he is hired, he instantly knows how to make crabby patties. I'm paraphrasing here, since it's been forever since I read the theory, but shortly after the fall of the Republic and the secreting away of Anakin Skywalker's newborn children, an agreement was struck between Obi-Wan Kenobi, Chewbacca, and R2-D2 to put themselves into a position to guard over those children and watch them to uh, protect them from Vader slash the Emperor and more importantly to be watch and see if they show any force sensitivity and seem to be following in their father's footsteps. If they showed force sensitivity and seemed well adjusted they could be taken into hand and trained into the first of a new order of secret GD. If they showed evidence of following Vader's path they could be dealt with before they became a large threat. I know Kenobi opting to settle on Tatooine for his hermitage to watch over Luke is established, but I like the idea that he was dedicated to avoiding another Vader, even if that meant killing Luke at the first sign of trouble. I see how R2-D2 and Kenobi fit in the theory, with R2 at Leia's side and Kenobi with Luke. But I'm not seeing how Chewbacca fits in as he was with Han in the first movie, chronologically. How would Chewie keep an eye on either of them? In this theory Chewie links up with Han, and is the one to suggest that they do jobs for Jabba the Hutt, essentially putting their base of operations on Tatooine with Obi-Wan. As a bonus it would imply that the meeting between Chewie and Ben was not a coincidence. Bruce Banner has died several times in the MCU, but the Hulk effectively resurrected him each time. In the Avengers, he claims that the Hulk spat out a bullet when Banner attempted suicide. In Age of Ultron, Black Widow pushes Banner down a deep hole. The Hulk jumps back out. In Thor Ragnarok, Banner jumps from a ship and lands headfirst on the Rainbow Bridge. 
we see him lie there motionless. But a few seconds later, Hulk is fighting the giant wolf. The other guy keeps saving his life. The immortal Hulk run in the comics pretty much makes this canon. The supernatural storyline isn't real. Gabriel made Sam envision it all, and at the end, he'll tell him, and that is what will happen, if you say yes to Dean, when he shows up tonight. It's such a Gabriel thing to do. In the butterfly effect, Ashton Kutcher's mother states that she had multiple stillbirths before having successfully birthed him. At the end of the movie, he ends up killing himself in the womb so that all the pain he caused the people he loved would never happen. My theory is that all the other stillbirths his mother had were a product of the babies having lived similar lives to Ashton's and they all came to the same conclusion that killing themselves before birth is the best option. Spoilers for Firewatch. Firewatch, my theory is that for the whole game, Delala was intentionally being dishonest with and gaslighting Henry the closer he got to discovering that Ned was still living in the park, because I believe Delala knew he was living there, possibly as a favor for Ned. The way I perceive things, I think that Brian truly did fall on accident, even if it was due to Ned's negligence. And as a result, I think Ned couldn't find it in himself to leave the place where his son had died, whether it be from feeling attached to the area and being unable to leave, not wanting to face the music and get the police involved, or a combination of the two. I think Ned likely came up with some convoluted lie to tell Delala so that she'd let him stay. And since Delala liked Brian so much as well as Ned, I think she'd likely be willing to keep it between them that Ned was still in the park. I don't believe she knew that Brian was dead I think she likely assumes that Ned sent him back home for the school year with other family members watching him. I don't think she ever thought the situation would escalate as much as it did, especially with the events of the game taking place when Henry arrives. This is why I think her reaction of disbelief, anger, and grief at the end when Henry informs her that he found Brian in the cave was genuine. She personally feels, on top of the loss of a kid she truly liked, betrayed. From her reaction, we can clearly see she thinks Ned killed Brian and she likely feels ashamed, guilty, and angered for letting him stay in the park, because this would mean she somehow helped the person, in her mind, who killed Brian. Compared to the very real emotions she exudes at the end of the game, during the rising actions of the story, she's very slow to believe, trying to stall, and act like she's confused, or like Henry's jumping to conclusions, in a lot of the events that occur to Henry throughout his time at the park. Like finding the clipboard, or getting hit over the head, or not taking him seeing the figure, who was Ned, at night near his tower seriously. The Minecraft law, it says that there were people like you in this world before, they built temples, mini shafts and knew how to travel through the nether. The water was rising, and destroyed many fishing villages, that's why you find ruins and religious monuments, other villages were destroyed by a wither, that's why villages have ugly cliffs and holes. The last survivors who didn't drown, withered or got zombfected built shelters, strongholds, and got into the end. Their only food source was chorus fruits. After a long time they absorbed the teleportation power of the fruits and became endermen. You should free the end from the dictatorship of the ender dragon. Edit, my interpretation of a theory by the game theorist. I've also heard a somewhat similar Minecraft theory, related to its changelog. The earliest versions of Minecraft were pretty barren, mostly dirt and rock and the occasional monster. Over time, more and more trees, animals, and structures were added. In recent updates, even coral and bees, the theory is that Minecraft is a post-apocalyptic world, and its update cycle is just the process of natural life slowly returning to the world. The brown-haired mermaid who appears in Disney's Peter Pan as Ariel's mother, and was crushed to death under Captain Hook's ship. Yes. Peter Pan was released 36 years before The Little Mermaid, but Disney has been known to retroactively make details like that into canon, such as when they declared Goofy Jr. to be the same character as Maximum. Then again, none of the Disney DTV sequels were ever intended as canon, just money grabs, and that's the only real source we have for any info on Ariel's mother. Still I like to imagine there being a connection between the mermaids in Peter Pan and Ariel's family somehow. 
Dale Gribble knows full well that he didn't father Joseph and Nancy was cheating on him with John Ridcorn for over a decade. He just chooses not to act. Dr. Doofench murders Phineas's, and probably Candace's, biological dad. We know that Doof dated Linda at one point. This would explain Phineas's uncomfortably shaped head, as well as his genius and his incredible mechanical aptitude. This one is entertaining, but has mostly been debunked. We know that Doof and Linda dated prior to Linda's pop star career as Linda in the 80s, as shown by their conversation at the drive-in theater. It's unlikely that they continued dating any time later on, seeing as the date was a flop. Given the time period the show takes place in, it's safe to assume that Phineas was born in the late 90s or early 2000s well after the end of the Lindana days. Sorry that this one's a little long. In Little Shop of Horrors, the musical version not the movie, towards the end of the show Audrey leaves the shop that has Seymour and Audrey second in it, tries to drink some tea, and take sleeping pills. Some an expert can't go to sleep because she's too worried about Seema. She comes back to the shop and the plant tries to get Audrey to come closer and give him some water while Seema is away and then while she's close he tries to eat her but Seema rushes in and is able to take her out of Audrey Second's mouth. Audrey, lying on the floor, says that she's about to die and that Seema should feed her to the plant because it would bring him success and after she presumably dies, he does just that. But the thing is, her wounds should not have been that bad, it's kinda weird that just a bite or two from this plant could kill someone, but then you remember the fact that Audrey took a Somonex, a sleeping pill that can cause side effects of drowsiness, incoordination, and sometimes confusion. Audrey didn't die, the pills kicked in, she felt dizzy and sleepy and thought she was going to die, and she just fell asleep, leading to Seema run intentionally murdering his girlfriend by feeding her to his plant. Agent Smith is the chosen one. Not near. Basically this video youtub.com link. George Weasley is actually Willy Wonka. In the books, we see that Fred and George make all sorts of crazy candy and they are really good at it. So things like the snoozeberries and the gobstoppers are not far-fetched. Plus the whole place is candy and the last scene with the elevator can only be explained by magic. But Fred dies and George could not handle being surrounded by wizards all the time, so he goes to live with the muggles and becomes a recluse. The Oompa Lompas can easily be house elves. Plus Goj and Wonka look very similar and they dress alike. Wonka makes a few comments about not being able to hear correctly and we know George had his ear cut off. If you think about it, he was halfway there with Fred, having made a successful shop called Weasley's Wizarding Weezers. Triple W and then from there Willy Wonka, Double W he clearly kept the W's. And my favorite part is that in Wonka's office everything is cut in half. George never got over Fred's death, he never felt whole so nothing in his life can be whole. George is missing his other half. Pikachu is not the original one Ash was given. In short, initially Pikachu disobeys Ash, but then on the second episode, Ash faints and Pikachu is gone with a huge group of Chussel looking identical. At the end of the episode they are back together, but Pikachu is nice and friendly. Theory claims the original Pikachu escaped, and a wild one wanting a trainer came instead, with Ash missing the switch. Also, on the episode before, that the Pokédex clearly says that wild Pokémon are often jealous of Pokémon with a trainer, which may be a hint. Here's a really good detailed explanation of this theory with additional reinforcement I didn't mention, yahtoo.b link. I'm not sure that I believe it myself, but it's just kinda a fun one. I have a theory that the characters of Sesame Street are refugees from Monsters Incorporated. Their society collapsed, and to escape it, they went through the doors into the homes of the children. Many of them collected into Sesame Street apartments, and that's where they live now. Snowpiercer is a sequel to Willy Wonka. Edit, here's Youtub.com link, a video covering the theory. Thanks for watching. Do you have something to share? Leave it in the comments. Please like and subscribe for more edit readings. Links mentioned in this video can be found in the description. Have a great day.